All right, we're here, we're back, we're live. It's Monday at 3 o'clock, and we're actually talking about Hawaii, the state of clean energy, which is actually one of my favorite topics, with Marco Mangelsdorf, one of my favorite guests of ProVision Solar, who joins us, as usual, from Hilo, uh, where we have him by Skype. Hi, Marco. Right back at you, Jay. It's always a pleasure to talk to one of my favorite people. <laughs> We, we will reinvent the world, Marco. No kidding about that. <laughs> so today we talked about what we're going to talk about, and we kind of decided we would talk about sea changes in PV financing, because that, that is turning out to be a big issue, and it has long, long reach over many things that are happening in clean energy. I would, I would say it's got to be one of the biggest things happening. And the first thing that it affects is your list of your decline list as I as I would call it uh, you go and you do this research every month or quarter uh, among you know the counties especially Oahu with building permits for PV installations and you consistently find uh, you know a decline in the number of permits being taken out so what's your report now actually Marco well I'm actually working on what I kind of call my uh, half year in review uh, right now, Jay, I'm working on a, on a piece that I hope to finish in the next couple of weeks where I'll be looking at the first six months of this year and, and comparing them to the first six months of uh, 2013 to see what, what there is to be seen as far as conclusions or trends. And most likely, well, not most likely, but definitely the month of June, this month of June will be the 14th, 14th straight month of uh, a month over month decline of uh, portable take system permits issued by the Department of uh, Planning and Permitting on Oahu compared to June of last year. Uh, there'll probably be somewhere around 500 to 500 plus PV permits uh, issued this month, uh, which uh, is uh, not a, a minuscule number, but when you consider that back in October 2012, just to give you a, a reference point, October 2012 is when that, uh, that number peaked in terms of PV permits issued, and that was uh, 2,400 plus 2,400 plus PV permits were issued in October 2012, and now we're put putting along, at least on Oahu, at about 500, 500 to 600 per month. So clearly, a dramatic drop off of, uh, in this case, 75 some odd percent from the peak of uh, not all that long ago. Well, I've, I've always asked you when you you know described the uh, you know the decline as a, uh, a mathematical matter, what the reasons are. And uh, I'd like to ask you that again and ask you whether any of those reasons are changing while we watch. Well, I am actually reaching out to uh, a number of my industry brethren and sisterin, if there is such a word, <laughs> to try to get their takes as well. Uh, I'm waiting on uh, the responses of about four or five of my colleagues in the field. I've already got about four or five back, so I hope to have a 10 or more when all is said and done to not just uh, rely on my own analysis and my own judgment. So uh, I don't want to tip my hand in terms of what I'm getting back from my colleagues quite yet. But in my opinion, clearly the grid uh, penetration issue in terms of, as we've spoken about so many times in the past, uh, with more and more PV going in and more and more circuits, uh, not only on Oahu, of course, but across the state, are reaching a level of PV penetration that is giving the uh, utilities cause for pause, and and that is uh, certainly slowing things down. Everybody who's in the business and even the many homeowners know about that. So that that's one uh, factor, one reason to uh, to consider. And uh, another one that perhaps is uh, even even as disturbing, if not more so, is it could it be that the the market demand for residential grid type photovoltaic systems has peaked, and the only way to to know that definitively is to, for the peak to take place and to be on the downside long enough to be able to say, oh, that's when it took place. Now, is it possible that? Uh, it could go back up again, uh, certainly, but to what extent have we reached kind of a, a natural adoption rate or, or sustainable adoption rate 
that will continue, that there will be nothing close to the, uh, the, the wild and crazy days of uh, especially late 2012 when, as I mentioned, you had uh, permits being issued by the thousands on a, on a monthly basis. So, you know, I just want to remind everybody, despite the, the complaining, uh, some of it legitimate and some of it not so, about being having it be difficult to to be able to install PV systems in, in the circuits of the grid that we still, the state of Hawaii, can rightfully claim having the highest amount of grid-type photovoltaic systems per capita per household in the entire country. So, again, as I mentioned on, I think, a number of occasions, we're really going collectively in a state where no state has gone before, where no utilities have gone before in terms of trying to get a more definitive answer of just how much can the uh, electric grids, these isolated electric grids that we have in the state, how, how much more uh, variable uh, distributed generation can they accommodate? You know, it's funny you say that, uh, you know, that we're ahead of the game nationally. Um, and indeed, you know, we have a lot of sun. Um, we're, we're tropical islands. Um, and we have other renewables, too. Uh, on the other hand, you know, it seems to me also that I, I have trouble putting Hawaii up as a leader for the rest of the world to follow. I, there are people in the world who would like to follow us as a leader for the rest of the world to follow. But in fact, I think we've made so many footfalls uh, and we've had so many contentions and controversies um, that, it, you know, it doesn't seem like a smooth road at all. Um, and, you know, one, one hardly sees us as, as, as a model of um, introduction of renewable energy these days. We might have been a few years ago or so it seemed, but now it seems like we're stuck in so many things. What do you think? Well, I'd like to, I hear what you're saying at the same time, I want to counter that with some, some, some basic uh, statistics, which uh, in the, the liner notes uh, that come with uh, our Hiko Helco Miko bills, so their little uh, newsletter that comes with every bill, uh, the one I received uh, not too long ago showed what the percentage breakdown was of Helco's power generation by source uh, coming into the grid in 2013 and uh, going from oil to geothermal, solar, wind, and hydro. And that came out to over 40-plus percent renewable over 40 percent and that's actually a deceptive figure and I'll tell you why because that just accounts for actual Helco controlled generation whether it's what they are producing themselves or whether they're getting from an independent power producer that does not take into account all the PV that has been installed on the customer side of the meter which there, there's no methodology that I know of mm. to be able to determine just how many kilowatt hours, megawatt hours have been produced by all this PV on an on a accurate basis. But there's no doubt in my mind that when you factor in all those megawatt hours of PV produced behind the meter, on the customer side of the meter, that renewable energy on the big island probably took care of somewhere around half of all the island's electricity needs. And that, to me, is pretty darn impressive. Now. That's on the electrical, uh, electrical, electric generation side. But of course, as again, we've spoken about before, I think uh, in terms of overall energy consumption for the state, our real Achilles heel, which has defied laws and defied policy, uh, proposed policies to improve, is transportation. That's where we're really stuck in terms of being hooked on uh, liquid uh, petroleum. Yeah. But going back to, um, going back to those uh, home homes with PV that we don't have any record on and we can't say how much more than the 40 percent of the Big Island uh, is being generated by PV and, you know, in, on rooftops. It seems to me that if we had um, applied smart grid equipment, if we had those smart meters that were being discussed, oh my goodness, six, seven years ago, uh, then we would know that. And we would have a handle on everything that's going on in the Big Island and everywhere else. Um, so, you know, when I say, have we, have we moved in accordance with our own aspirations? Um, you know, I don't know why we haven't put those smart meters everywhere. 
And, and what is kind of interesting is what's happening in Kauai. In Kauai, the, um, you know, the members of the KIUC cooperative voted no. They didn't want smart meters. So, you know, for at least for a while, maybe a long while, there won't be smart meters there either. Um, so I, I, don't think that's, I don't think that's progress. That's more like getting stuck in something. If we were really doing progress, we'd have smart meters everywhere by now. Well, I, I have to take issue with the, uh, the implication that smart meters are some type of uh, magic fix that's going to lead us to any kind of promised land. I think uh, uh, whether you call it smart meters part of the smart grid, I think it's, uh, it's uh, at least uh, somewhat overrated in terms of where, where, that type, where these techno fixes are going to, to take us. Oh, I, I agree that smart, smart meters are not the smart grid. Uh, smart meters are only a way to know what, what is happening in each individual home. Uh, and, I, and I think that smart grid, I, I agree with you that smart grid is, uh, uh, is really a very mm, uh, hard term to define, and we haven't yet uh, defined it. You talked about uh, uh, the cause for pause, um, and uh, you talked about, um, you know, the, uh, the, the problem of uh, the marketplace, um, and, and I think uh, it's a combination of things why people are not so interested in, in taking the low-hanging fruit anymore, is, you know, one is you're going to find a certain percent of the population really likes new and exciting and high-tech things, and they're going to be first adopters. Hawaii is yeah. known as a first adopter state for technology, consumer technology, and I think those very same people, you know, in the name of in the name of um, the environment, if you will, and renewables as a concept, um, you know, they're going to they're going to act first. But I think we've passed that part of the population, and people are, you know, the, the next. There's not so much low hanging fruit right now. Um, the other part of it is that when you see, you know, the problem about interconnect, you say, well, you know, I don't want to get involved in that kind of thing. I'm going to stay a, a long, just a far, a far piece away from all of that. I'm not going to do it. I'm going to wait till this all settles down. So I think we've, you know, we've passed, you know, your numbers to me indicate we've passed out of that phase, the phase where, you know, all the early adopters were taking the low-hanging fruit and, and we were, you know, we were ramping up on PV everywhere. Uh, I think that's, I think that's over. And I don't think it's, it's going to be like it was, you know, for a long time, if ever. I think it's going to move on to other things uh, to wit, these uh, PV farms, which nobody objects to on an environmental level, um, which, uh, you know, seem to get through the environmental process okay and the permitting process. You have a number of them that have gone up in the last couple of years. And, and now, and this is a remarkable sea change, uh, Hawaiian Electric is putting its own uh, or trying to put its own uh, PV farm up. And that's different because that means that I don't have to spring for a PV on my roof. I can let the utility do it. I don't have to take the risk. I don't have to have the holes punched uh, in my roof. I don't have to worry about any of those things. Uh, and I can achieve the same level of satisfaction that, you know, that uh, the environment is, is being respected and renewables are being used. Um, so don't you agree uh, that we are, we are in a different place somehow? We're in a different chapter than we were before the decline. Well, especially, yes, I would, especially uh, when you see uh, the, the national figures, uh, which, of course, Hawaii uh, is, is a part of this trend very much so, that is showing that for both uh, commercial and residential, residential uh, uh, much more uh, dramatically, that more and more homeowners across the state and across the country are opting not to purchase the system, the portable take system, uh, nor to finance it, finance it themselves, but to allow some uh, other entities, uh, an investor, a group of investors essentially, to own the system that's going to be put up on their roof at essentially no out-of-pocket cost to them with the investors getting the tax credits and depreciation and the homeowner agreeing to pay for the EV power produced over as long as a 20-year 
contract period at uh, typically is going to be a rate, a good chunk lower than the utility rate that they're currently paying. And if you look at uh, some of the recent numbers, which I just came across this past weekend, uh, for 2011, for example, the percentage of those homeowners who was going the what we call the third-party option uh, route, where someone else is uh, paying for the system to be installed, and essentially the homeowner is is renting or leasing their roof for for uh, zero or very nominal rate. Uh, about 42 percent of homeowners were doing that in 2011 nationally, and uh, last year in 2013 that number had jumped to two thirds or 66 uh, percent. So the trend toward homeowners uh, deciding that it made more sense for them to have someone else incur the expense for the installation of the, of the equipment and maintenance of the equipment, uh, clearly that is uh, that, that trend seems to be going uh, higher and higher in terms of more and more homeowners doing that. And you can see by the, the major players in the state uh, in terms of the top permit pullers from Vivint Solar to Sunrun and Solar City are uh, are the ones who are doing the best in these uh, difficult times of declining permit numbers. Yeah, absolutely. And that's a great this is a great segue for a break. But when we come back from the break, I'd like to take ta talk more with you about the um, the sea change in PV financing, which is the title of our show, and see where that's going. Not only on the personal residence side, but all over the PV lot, so to speak, and uh, especially on the on-bill financing initiative. That's Marco Mangelsdorf. He's with Pro ProVision Solar in Hilo, joins us by Skype here in Hawaii, the state of clean energy, uh, where we're searching sea changes in PV financing. We'll be right back. I'm Hong Jiang, host for Asia in Review on Tuesdays. And I'm David Day host for Asian Review on Thursdays. Both of us broadcast our respective shows at 4 p.m. And my topics tend to deal with uh, questions related to environment, culture, history, and sometimes human rights. And my shows tend to be on international business, foreign policy, geopolitics, and national security. And you can watch our shows live on the ThinkTech website at thinktechhawaii.com. And uh, you can also watch us on YouTube or Olalo. So come join us on Thursdays at 4 p.m. I'm David Day. And Ar on Tuesdays at 4 p.m., I'm Hong Jiang. Aloha. Aloha. We're back. We're live. We're here in Hawaii, the state of clean energy, searching for sea changes in PV financing with Marco Mangelsdorf of ProVision Solar, who joins us from Hilo by Skype. We are so happy to have him. So we talked about all these things that, you know, uh, that that are either cause or effect of the decline in PV installations. And the one thing that you, you, know, you, you raised before the, uh, the break, Marco, uh, is the availability of new models of financing. This started happening, as you said, two or three years ago. And I remember how uh, Synetric got so heavily involved in this. In fact, uh, they, they joined uh, with a mainland company uh, to, to, to bring the mainland company in to do their financing. I guess they saw into the future. They saw Vivent and, what is it, Solar City coming down the pike. And I think Revolution has also done a lot of this financing. So one, you know, the, for the successful players, it goes hand in glove, PV and financing. We'll handle your financing. And as you know, it's a whole menu of possibilities uh, between lease and financing and all kinds of different, you know, calculations, um, sort of off the automobile market, even like that. And so here we are where not only um, the mainland companies, but the local companies are all bundling the financing. I mean, all the successful ones, isn't it true? All the successful ones are bundling the financing programs with the PV. It changes things, doesn't it? Oh, dramatically so, dramatically, because then rather than uh, PV being limited to essentially uh, upper middle income uh, homeowners who have the available cash or who are willing to finance it through their own means, uh, which is a smaller market segment certainly, that being able to go after a larger market portion, which uh, is the, the, the desire of any, any company that's uh, peddling the product, uh, that uh, this allows uh, way more 
customers, way more people to be able to uh, to essentially purchase or, or acquire your product. Well, so there's a there's a, a synchronization issue, I think, because it was uh, I want to say four years ago, maybe maybe more, maybe five. Uh, Blue Planet Foundation and Jeff Michelina came up with this idea, um, you know, about on bill financing, and um, you know, they were they made a full court press about it. Uh, they told everybody, you know, it was a good idea, and a lot of people bought into it. I don't think the utility, at least uh, Hawaiian Electric, was all that excited about it because it meant all kinds of work for them uh, to, to build their customers for somebody else's installation uh, and then to absorb all the, you know, cost of that administration and the risk of that administration. I wouldn't have been too excited about it myself. But <clears throat> they, I think they were willing to go along with it. And then it, it, it had to go in front of the, uh, I think, the legislature. And then uh, the legislature gave it to the PV, to the PUC. And the PUC gave it, uh, they were supposed to implement it, but instead of doing that, they, they handed it off to a study. And the study took a year. And then it came back to the PUC. Uh, and in that time, uh, the legislature adopted a new piece of legislation, which was, surprise of surprises, a banking arrangement, another financing arrangement for ostensibly larger projects uh, that came from DBED and the director of DBED, Richard Lim, a former banker. Uh, this was the one significant initiative that had come out of DBED uh, for energy in, in these past uh, four years. And um, so the question is, where are we on that now? That legislation was passed in 20, um, 2012 or 2013. 2013, and so far it's it's only rumors as to what what's happening with it and when it's going to come out and who has to rule on it and approve it and tinker with it and tune it and where are we, Marco? Well, back in October of last year, the PUC essentially put out a request for proposals to be able to select a contractor. Uh, a company that was going to serve as essentially the program administrator of the statewide on bill financing program, which, uh, like you mentioned, was, is going to, when it actually happens, finance energy efficiency and renewable energy improvement uh, programs and, and projects around the state. And uh, now we're one day away from July of 2014, and I do not know where the the process is at in terms of how much closer this uh, as you mentioned this uh, law that was passed by last le last year's legislature how much closer it is to actually being implemented but whether it's going to happen next week or next month or two months or five or six months from now uh, it would be my position that uh, as we were talking about the fact is that you have already had, we've already had these uh, multiple companies coming in to the state and making it possible for, for homeowners and business owners to put PV systems in essentially no cost out of pocket to, uh, to, to these uh, companies and homes that uh, I, I have a hard time seeing how on-bill financing is going to make that much of a tangible difference. I mean, if this had come out four or five years ago, it would have made a substantial difference. But uh, the, the private sector has already moved into the market to offer more or less the same type of uh, program, the same type of benefits as on-bill financing would you know, do. You know, that's very interesting. You say that uh, here we are in July and, and there's no word on it. And indeed, I, I don't think there's been any word on the detail. This would have to be detail-rich anyway. It's like inventing a whole new chapter in the Uniform Commercial Code about all this commercial paper and who's responsible for what and what happens on default. This is very complex business. And the state has sailed right into this um, and is apparently trying to reinvent uh, you know, commercial paper for PV and this special uh, GEMS uh, program. Uh, and I think, you know, it, that's symbolic of not enough information for the public. I mean, one of the problems of this initiative is that we don't get clear information 
about what's going on, about who's doing what, and what's going to happen when. Uh, and I think, uh, you know, here we are, and it's, it's almost July. We don't know what's going on. We haven't been tipped off. In fact, it almost feels like they've been withholding the details, and they're going to pop them one day. Um, and I, you know, I, I think that tends to discourage the public and makes them less trusting of government and the process by which these programs are rolled out. But that's my, that's my reaction to it. Uh, on the other hand, um, you know, as you say, we, we have these vivid and large mainland companies who have lots of money to invest and successfully do it, and they do it on market terms which consumers are willing to, willing to abide by, willing to agree to. Uh, why then do we need a whole new universe of financing uh, for these PV systems? You know, you really wonder if the whole idea, which was, you know, I guess what happened is first Ambil financing came out, then this GEMS program, which was much more ornate, sort of, sort of, you know, completely revamped that idea and extended it to all kinds of directions with much greater complexity. And now, what's going to happen? Do we really need this? Do we really need this money coming? You know, the money that goes into the Onville Financing and GEMS program uh, comes from the rate payers, Marco. Um, right. You and me, and uh, we're going we're to put money into a great big pot. That pot is going to be used to, to pay off the installment contracts uh, or to cover them in case there's a default. Um, this is very complicated. It's essentially a guarantee uh, for the contractors who put it in. But the contractors who put it in are not the contractors on your list that you use when you talk about decline. The contractors are only a couple of contractors handled by a third contractor uh, who is apparently being selected uh, from the mainland to be the administrator here. The bottom line is my sense of it, although I, you know, we'll see what the details are when they come out, my sense of it is that <clears throat> the benefits of this are going to be principally for a very few contractors and not the local contractors who have been complaining about the decline in their business for the past few years. And so it doesn't respond to that. Instead, it responds to a hypothetical group of new contractors from far away who are going to do big jobs even when they could finance those jobs themselves. Am I going on too long? <laughs> no, 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 not, not at all. I think, uh, let, me, uh, let me address that this way. Uh, you talked about the rate payers uh, paying yet again for, for more of these programs, and I just wanted to uh, remind you that uh, you and I and all the other uh, rate payers in Eco, Helco, and Nico land are already paying into a pot of money called the Public Benefits Fund, or PBF, that is supposed to be doing good things with the ratepayer money in terms of energy efficiency and reducing our, our dependence on imported fossil fuels. So uh, this on-bill financing and um, the GEMS program at well would be uh, yet another pot of money that would be established uh, that uh, would ostensibly be used to do good things for all of us collectively. But, uh, you know, I, I was going back to some of my notes here as I'm working on this article uh, that I hope to finish in the next week or two. And uh, my, my good friend Sophie Cox, uh, who writes for Civil Beat, she attended a, uh, I don't know what you call it, a ceremony or a presentation. It certainly wasn't a press conference, but this was in late April at the Capitol building. Uh, the, the governor and uh, the three public utility Commission commissioners were there by his side, and uh, the governor stated that uh, Hawaii had, quote, turned the corner, unquote, in its shift to renewable energy. Uh, there is no turning back, he said, uh, as the commissioners were standing behind or next to him. And indeed, uh, claimed uh, Governor Abercrombie, quote, the Rubicon has been crossed, unquote, in Hawaii, and, quote, the time for talk has ended and the time for action is upon us, close quote. And he didn't, nor did the commissioners take any questions. So, uh, you know, according to Sophie, apparently she, as long as the other, as well as the other reporters there, were kind of scratching their head as to, well, what, what is it that we were just told? 
So th perhaps that's somewhat emblematic of the, the verbiage that uh, is prone to being used uh, by uh, at least some elected officials and others that uh, really is kind of a uh, vacuous gobbledygook in terms of, uh, okay, what exactly are we doing and how are we doing it? But, I mean, in the meantime, again, the private sector, I'll go back to my private sector point, that they're just rolling on as far as these, uh, these uh, companies and, uh, and major financial institutions that are investing hundreds of millions of dollars in companies, publicly, comp publicly traded companies like, like Solar City, that they just keep on rolling right along while uh, the state machinery continues to just kind of, dare I say, grind along at its, pace, at its own pace while the market just kind of leaves them further and further behind. I know I, I feel like I'm sounding a bit too cynical, but uh, maybe it's just, uh, maybe it's just uh, one of those cynical Monday kind of days. Well, I'm, I, I understand the cynicism, and I'd just like to take a page out of uh, what you described uh, from Sophie on this. Uh, the two statements says, so we've crossed the Rubicon, he said. Um, and uh, that's interesting. What, what Rubicon? I mean, so far it's been only, talk I mean, if you look at the DBED initiative, this is the first initiative they've had in four years on uh, renewable energy, and it's still on the drawing boards. Uh, and you really wonder whether it's going to be, you know, uh, appropriate uh, after the time goes by, maybe moot. And then, and then the other point that uh, you, you quoted her for him saying was, it's time, it's, it's not time for talk anymore. Um, frame rhetoric, um, but it's time for action. So how could we have crossed the Rubicon if we have yet to take the action? Uh, that's a rhetorical question. Well, I wanted to make sure I understood clearly what uh, my mind and my recollection told me in terms of uh, the Rubicon, which, by, by the way, is a, is a river in, in, in Italy, uh, but uh, it, it goes back to the age of antiquity, and essentially one once that Rubicon was crossed, essentially it's a point of no turning back. So no turning back to what? Uh, it just, it, it's just, uh, <laughs> it's just it's this type of somewhat flower, flowery language that I have a difficult uh, time at times translating into, into the, the, the reality and, and practical, uh, practicality on the ground. No, it's rhetoric, and uh, that's, that's the problem. We've had rhetoric, we don't have details, and here it is almost July. We, we don't have on-bill financing uh, at hand, and, and we don't know how it works, uh, nor do we know how the GEMS program works, or how the GEMS program relates to the on-bill financing, or how they could actually function in a, in, a, in a universe where financing is easily available from a number of companies who are doing it better than, better than local companies can do it. And I, I think that's the sea change that's most uh, interesting of all, and is that over time, looking at your uh, you know, decline list is what's happening is uh, the, the financing is bundled with the PV. The people who have the money and the skill, you know, the legal skill, whatever it is, to do these financing deals are the ones who are taking a larger and larger share of the market. And for the most part, those companies are from the mainland. So where we had all these local companies, sorry, like yours, like uh, Pro Provision Solar and Hilo, um, more and more, they're going to be under pressure from these mainland companies who can handle it all. And where uh, on-bill financing fits in all that, it's hard to say. Where GEMS fits in, in all of that, it's hard to say. It's so much that it gives me a headache. When I have a headache, I have to take a break. So why don't we take a short break, Marco? That's Marco Mangelsdorf, ProVision Solar and Hilo uh, in Hawaii, the state of clean energy, where we are searching uh, for sea changes in PV financing. Okay, Mar Marco, is that all right? We'll be right back. Aloha, my name is Willow Chang Alion, and I host a show called The Art of Life. We air live every Friday from 2 to 3 p.m. And what we do is basically we focus on individuals who create a unique sense of place for Hawaii. These are movers and shakers, artists, innovators. They are also traditionalists. They're all involved in the archival process. And they make this place a unique place, one that makes Hawaii 
a richer place to be. I hope you do join us and certainly tell your friends about the show, whether they live here or they live abroad. It's a way to give back to our community. We're keeping it Pono. Okay, we're back, we're live. We're here with Marco Mangelsdorf, our, our favorite uh, guy. Uh, we joins us by Skype every few weeks from ProVision Solar and Hilo here in Hawaii, the state of clean energy, where we are talking about uh, sea changes, especially in PV financing. And, uh, you know, one of the, one of the questions, uh, you know, that came to mind during our discussion last segment, Marco, was that you pointed out <clears throat> that the, the rate payer has to pay into this benefits fund. The rate payer will have to pay more uh, into the special fund that uh, the GEMS program is requiring. Uh, and the taxpayer has to pay to support the tax credits also. So between those three things, that's a significant amount of money. Um, and, I, and I wonder how that compares, for example, with the situation where the utility goes out and says, we're going to build our own PV farm. It'll be big. I forget what uh, Hawaiian Electric wants to do. I, I want to think it's uh, 5 or 10 megawatts. Uh, <clears throat> it'll be big, and we'll fund it. Um, and I'm not sure how the accounting works, but we, we'll, I think it's we'll pay for it, and, uh, uh, and um, we'll, you'll have cheaper energy and manageable prices. And if we did that all over the state, which we could do because we haven't even started using the available land for this sort of thing, um, we'd be better off and we wouldn't have to worry about, you know, all these issues. So the question is, would it be cheaper to the taxpayer and ratepayer if, if, the, if the utility just built large PV farms? I don't have an answer to that, Jay. Uh, one can, however, note that the trend, and, and I'm not a great follower of the utility, of electric utilities uh, across the U.S. per se. I'm, I'm much more narrowly focused on what utilities are doing in, in our own little state here. But clearly over the years, there has been a definite trend amongst utility companies to divest themselves of their generating assets and to become less so companies that both generate power and transmit it and distribute it uh, to a, a more of a model that is uh, reducing or has reduced their generation capacity that they own outright and becoming more of a T&D company, transmission distribution. So if the HECO companies were going to truly pursue uh, a strategy where they see it in their best interest to uh, finance and have uh, commercial scale, utility scale PV projects uh, that they will own and operate over the life of the system, that would represent uh, a rather surprising kind of a counter example or counter trend to what seems to be uh, a decades long trend of utility companies divesting themselves of generation capacity. But if so you put yourself, you put yourself in the shoes of a uh, utility company and, uh, you know, peop I mean, they've, they've talked about making themselves a, a transmission company, right? And, I, and that's the trend you're talking about all over the country. Uh, we're just a transmission company. You, get, you generate the power, you give us the power, and we'll have the technology to deliver the power, but we don't actually transmit it ourselves. Um, and, and that indeed is the trend. But, but query, is there a downside for uh, Hawaiian Electric or any utility company to say, look, you know, we don't mind, we don't mind uh, doing RFPs and having, uh, you know, investors uh, uh, build uh, PV facilities, but we want to do it too. I mean, do you see any, any utility generation issues that come out of that that are problematic? You know, to me, Jay, it really must come down to how can it be done cheaper? Mm -hmm. Who can do it cheapest? Mm -hmm. And if the utility company, as, it's, as it looks at its projections for the next two years, five years, ten years, okay, how much generation do we need to bring online in order to meet increasing demand if there is, in fact, increasing demand? 
and then go about trying to figure out, okay, what are the means to do that? How can we do it most cost effectively? And again, the trend has clearly been that they can, utility companies can do it cheaper by having someone else take on the risk and liability and expense of building utility scale power generation, whether it's going to be using garbage like gauge power whether it's going to be hydro, whether it's going to be wind, whether it's going to be solar, whether it's going to be bunker fuel, how can it be done as cheap as possible and still be reliable? So, you know, I don't have uh, insight really into the top execs uh, at HECO in terms of are they dabbling perhaps by going forward with a 15 megawatt utility scale power plant that would be provided by, say, Solar City if memory serves correctly, at a cost of X millions of dollars that will essentially be owned and operated by HECO? Uh, is this a, a chance for them to kind of get their feet wet, the utility get their feet wet and get actual experience with them owning, with them owning generating capacity? I, I don't know. Well, you know, one thing that strikes me out of that is um, that if, if they do this, um, they will have to address the interconnect issue. And if I were a homeowner out there with, um, you know, uh, a, 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 an installation that wasn't connected, that was blocked from being connected, and I saw the utility company building its own PV facility and connecting without, you know, without a word, I would say, wait a minute, what happened to me? Uh, how come they can connect to, the, to their own selves? And I can connect. I mean, I don't know if that would actually happen, but it strikes me as an issue that would have to be resolved. And it takes me uh, to one other issue I'd like to raise with you, and that is, you know, so the PUC issued this order requiring uh, the utility, I guess it's HECO, uh, to do a bunch of things about the grid. What's the status of that? And and what is the import of it, in, you know, in the, in the larger landscape we've been talking about? Excellent question, Jay. Excellent question. And the pressure is on, essentially, uh, for my uh, eco friends to respond in a detailed, thoughtful, and comprehensive fashion to the four orders slash decision and orders which were uh, published and announced publicly by the PUC in late April. And the PUC gave HECO 120 days to respond. Uh, so all eyes now, or at least many eyes, are on that uh, late uh, August uh, date when uh, HECO will be providing a substantial uh, 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 very uh, large documents, I'm sure, to the three PUC commissioners in response to uh, to the DNOs uh, and orders of uh, of late April. So uh, it will be, uh, I'm sure, make for a very interesting reading. And uh, I have no doubt that Eco is devoting uh, a lot of resources to uh, to come up with uh, with something uh, comprehensive that they believe is going to be. Uh, passing, hopefully passing muster with the, uh, the commissioners. And, uh, you know, uh, I'm not going to bet on uh, everything they're coming up with. I've spoken to some of my HECO contacts there, and uh, uh, I believe that they are uh, going to be thinking out of the box and, uh, and, and thinking in ways that they haven't been used to thinking and, and putting forth proposals that they haven't been used to putting forth. And, and I'm, uh, I'm uh, kind of excited to see what they come up with. Uh, but then I circle back to uh, how is that going to affect the reality on the ground in the near term? And uh, the, the fact of the matter is that it's not. It's not, because whatever ECO comes up with uh, will be considered all in its uh, due diligence and good time by the, the commission. And uh, whatever they propose uh, will take time to implement. And in the meantime, uh, I, I'm, I'm much more focused on the near term, the short term, than I am over the mid to long term because uh, I, I and the, as well as my colleagues in the industry, I think are much more concerned with meeting payroll this week, next week, next month, two months, four months from now, than what the grid is going to look like and what the PUC commission, uh, commissioners are going to do in six months, eight months, 12 months from now. 
uh, you know, which we're much more short-term oriented necessarily so. Yeah. So, uh, uh, and, and kind of along those lines, uh, I, I want to bring up uh, something that kind of caught my eye of a couple, three weeks ago, that I, there was a, a eco RFP request for proposals for, uh, for battery storage. And uh, our friend Dwayne Shimagawa from Pacific Business News apparently was one of the few, if, if only, reporter there uh, at this uh, gathering in Honolulu where upwards of 200, 200 companies from different parts of the country and the world showed up either in person or remotely to, to get in on a piece of the action, which to me is just, uh, it, it shows just how incredibly uh, important uh, and how disproportionate in terms of the attention that our teeny tiny little island state, as beautiful as it is, how much attention we're getting from so many different quarters as, uh, as uh, you, these utility companies here are trying to see just how much uh, distributed generation non-firm power that they can take. And of course, and as you and I have talked about many times, you know, batteries are a huge part of the equation. So... Um, I think, uh, you know, I'm really excited about batteries and what, what they can do because uh, they're going to play a big role, a bigger and bigger role as time goes on. But, again, I go back to what about the near-term horizon, time horizon, in terms of the next 3, 6, and 12 months. And that's where I think I feel uh, a bit more despondent at times in terms of uh, are the fixes uh, going to come uh, fast enough to be able to keep uh, – the PV industry from collectively going off a cliff because that's kind of what we're doing right now with a decrease year to year of somewhere around 50% in terms of uh, permits and uh, project value, at least on Oahu, first six months of 2014 compared to 2013. Well, I think, I think that really that brings it into the crosshairs um, because if you, if you look down the road, we'll have, we'll have batteries. Uh, and maybe these 200, uh, you know, proposers will, you know, have a significant effect on uh, the, uh, the technology available to the utility uh, to, you know, to take more renewables. But the question it raises for me, Marco, is whether the utility now has any heavy guns, you know, in, in the closet, on the, on the shelf there, that it can bring out, roll out, uh, to respond to the PUC's, you know, request for uh, upgrade of the grid. Um, and, you know, I don't have a sense of that, and I wondered if you have a sense of whether we could really take more renewables right now with either, A, existing equipment, or, B, with equipment that, you know, it's right there on the shelf ready to go, um, or whether this is going to be an exercise where you say, well, we don't really know and if you make us take more, you're going to risk bringing the whole thing down. And if you want us to take more, the only safe way is to wait until we get these batteries, uh, you know, available, and then we'll we'll have a, we'll all have a level of greater comfort. I mean, your worry about it happening in the future. But I wonder if you have any idea if Hico is prepared. I mean, technologically prepared, uh, or could be prepared uh, to take more renewables than it is already taken? Uh, I just don't have, uh, I don't have a clear answer to that, Jay. It's, it's, it's a work in progress, uh, uh, truly, and a, an, an incremental experiment that we're all part of uh, as far as just how much more, uh, especially in isolated, these isolated the grid can accommodate in terms of uh, variable non-firm power. And there you have it. <laughs> well, you know, Marco, we are at a, a turning point, a tipping point. Uh, it's really interesting to compare notes with you about all these things. There seems to be a lot of areas where we don't have answers, a lot of areas where we're waiting on something, we're waiting on Gordeaux. <laughs> and and I, I, I really love waiting together with you like this. There's something to come down the road and answer all these various questions we have propounded together. Thank you so much for coming around, Marco. It's always fun. 
Oh, Jay, thank you so much for having me. It's always a highlight of my week to know that I'm going to be speaking to my good buddy, Jay Fidel. <laughs> we'll do it again soon. That's Marco Mangelsdorf, ProVision Solar in Hilo, who really follows it all here in Hawaii, the state of clean energy, talking about sea changes in PV financing and other things on, on think tech, uh, think tech talks. Thank you so much, Marco. We'll talk to you soon. Hey, thank you again, Jay. Bye-bye. Aloha. Thank you.